press calls him the Hillside Strangler, but he may be part of a deadly duo. With little to go on, investigators face an uphill struggle as women continue to die. California's state parks contain hundreds of trails, but only one trailside killer. When the crime scene is as big as all outdoors, how can detectives hope to find him? A Midwestern highway is littered with the bodies of young men. Authorities know the identity of the interstate killer, but can they prove it before he kills again? Spurred on by the thrill of the kill, a serial murderer can't stop on his own. The longer it takes to catch him, the bigger the body count. They started on Halloween 1977. In the foothills just north of Los Angeles, the morning light brought a resident of a quiet suburban neighborhood a glimpse of horror. Sprawled in his front yard was a naked woman. She was dead. Not wanting his children to see the body, he covered her with a tarp. Detective Frank Salerno was one of the first inspectors to arrive. When I initially got the call, I was told that it may be an overdose. It was as soon as I saw the body, you know, it appeared to me without a doubt that it was a murder, not a, not a drug overdose of any type. There were ligature marks around her neck, wrists, and ankles, indicating that the woman had been tied up and strangled to death. She had also been raped. Police had no idea who she was or where she had come from. The only possible clue found at the scene was a small piece of white fiber on the victim's eyelid. It wasn't much, but it was all authorities had to work with. But Detective Salerno noticed one more thing that would be crucial to their search. It was the way the body lay. She looked like she had been placed at the location. She didn't look like she had been tossed. Uh, it actually looked like uh, maybe two people had carried her, maybe lifted her out of a trunk, lifted her from the bed of a pickup truck or something, and one had carried her from underneath her armpits and one had carried her from underneath her legs and placed her there. So my, it was just a, an overall impression that we may be dealing with two people. Investigators assumed this brutal strangling and the killer's careless disposal of the body was an isolated incident, just another unfortunate murder in Los Angeles. But the Halloween murder was only the beginning. Less than a week later, a jogger happened upon the nude body of a woman lying in plain sight beside the jogging path. With the second body, a deadly pattern began to emerge. Both victims had been raped, strangled, and dumped out in the open for anyone to find. Both bodies were practically on display, disposed of on slight inclines or hills. Uh, the only difference was that you had different bodies, but you had the same marks on the wrist in the same locations. You had the same marks on the ankles, almost to the inch of where they were on each body. You had the same mark on the throat, the same ligature mark. So at that point, we knew that we had uh, a single killer or killers that, that were at least responsible for two murders. But the murders didn't stop there. The press, unaware that authorities were searching for two suspects, dubbed the killer the Hillside Strangler. November 20th, a nine-year-old boy was playing near his house when he spied what he thought were two mannequins. Upon closer inspection, he realized they were not. Dolores Cepeda and Sonia Johnson had been missing for over a week 
before their bodies were found. They weren't even 15 years old. The crime fit the strangler's pattern to a T, except in this instance, there was a witness. A boy had seen the girls on the day of their disappearance. Once they got off the bus, he noticed they stopped to talk to someone in a car. He didn't see the stranger's face, but remembered the car was a large sedan. The girl's principal also gave police some useful information. She knew the girls personally and insisted that with the ever-present scare of the hillside strangler, the girls would probably not have gone anywhere with a stranger unless that stranger was masquerading as a policeman. Tension in the city and within the police force became palpable and officers stepped up their efforts to find the killers, whoever they might be. Uh, we were spending uh... Uh, seven days a week, uh, you know, 12, 15 hours a day working. Uh, that didn't slow down ever. Police had only hunches and few clues about the hillside strangler. They weren't sure if they were looking for one man or two, or whether the killer was truly an officer or just posing. Only one thing was certain. With each passing night, more women would die. November 28th, the killers did not take Thanksgiving off. When Lauren Wagner's parents realized she hadn't come in from the night before, they panicked. Even more disturbing was the fact that her car was parked out front. Whatever happened to Lauren took place after she got home. Officers canvassed the neighborhood, looking for any lead that might point them to a suspect. Have you heard anything, seen anything suspicious in the area? One neighbor recalled seeing Lauren pull up around 9 p.m., followed by another car. Two men jumped out and started arguing with her. The witness told investigators they didn't look like police. Even so, Lauren got into the car with them and drove off. Her body was found the next day. In addition to the strangler's telltale markings, some small fibers were found on Wagner's body. They didn't match the fiber found on the first victim. After nine brutal murders, it was only the second time any evidence was collected from a victim. Police continued to scour the streets. But with nothing more than a vague description of the suspect's car, there was not much to go on, and absolutely no way to match the fibers with the killer. The witness's report did, however, confirm the police's theory of two killers, and authorities now believe the men were merely posing as police. Six weeks later, the body of an 18-year-old prostitute turned up. This time, the killers were toying with police, like a cat with a mouse. They dumped the body on a hillside with City Hall as a backdrop. But it just seemed like they were trying to give us a message that they were still operating. Uh, they were operating uh, with impunity. They could do whatever they wanted, when they wanted. Police searched the apartment the prostitute had gone to that night and found fingerprints that they thought might belong to the killer. But they didn't come up with any matches in their databases. Then, as suddenly as the murders began, they stopped. With such little evidence to go on, there was not much detectives could do but sit and wait. After four months of terror in Los Angeles, an eerie calm fell over the city. The killers were still out there, but no one knew when or where the hillside stranglers would strike next. We don't have quotas. You can write as many as you want. In Bellingham, Washington, January 1979, a man reported that his girlfriend and her roommate were missing. He told police they were supposed to be house-sitting for an acquaintance who worked as a security guard. We all know him pretty well. 
Well, that's all I've got. Uh, do you guys have enough? Investigators went to the women's apartment. From the moment he arrived, Bellingham Police Chief Terry Mangan knew that Diane Wilder and Karen Mandick were in danger. And it was evident as soon as we got there that something was terribly wrong in the sense that they had left Diane Wilder's car there with some groceries in it, uh, some of which needed to be refrigerated. Uh, the cat had not been fed or let out, uh, and uh, the uh, lights were on. In a situation like this, it's difficult to discern what might be a clue. Police collected what they could, including a business card for a security guard named Kenneth Bianchi and a message in Diane Wilder's handwriting that said he'd called. Bianchi seemed like an obvious suspect, Hi, I'm but when police interviewed him, he denied knowing the women or of any house-sitting arrangement. He told them that he was at a law enforcement class that night, training to become a member of the sheriff's reserves. Hours later, police received the call they were dreading. A car had been discovered near a deserted construction site. Inside were two bodies, Diane Wilder and Karen Mandick. They had been strangled. Detectives determined that the murders most likely took place somewhere else. And whoever had left the bodies there had taken careful measures to clean up after himself. Authorities had trouble lifting fingerprints off the car. It had been wiped clean. Diane Wilder and Karen Mandick, both of them Western Washington students. Bellingham uh, police criminalist Bob Knudsen processed the scene. Uh, leaving Fred Myers at about seven o'clock. This was, in our opinion, uh, definitely not a first time killer. This is somebody who had been there before. But no matter how expert a killer is, chances are he'll leave a trace of himself behind. A single hair that did not belong to either of the women gave detectives some hope of linking the crime to a suspect. On one of the women's shoes and clothes were fuzzy gold fibers, most likely from a carpet. Locating the source might lead investigators to the murder site. Though finding a gold carpet would be no problem, the chances of finding the right one were slim. Detectives checked on an address found in the glove box. As the examination continued, authorities found something else. Stuck to the underside of the car were sprigs of fresh heather. Police brought the car to the lab to study the underside more closely. They found several fresh scrapes on the gas tank. Investigators speculated that when the killer threw the bodies into the car, the weight forced the back of the vehicle down onto a rock or something similar. The killer may have scraped the gas tank as he pulled away. A rock, a sprig of heather, and some gold carpet fibers. The perfect me, ingredients for a for mystery. I, uh, but how to solve it? I have some update it. on the missing girls, the co-ed case. Uh, control. We'll get the volunteers The address in the glove box led to an empty, locked house with case. gold carpeting. So we're try and... To obtain a key, police contacted the security we'll company that monitored it. Uh, Jack it Hansen. was the same security Jack company that Kenneth Bianchi worked for. Plan and we'll just sign some extra they told police that the key was missing from their file. While the paperwork allowing them to enter the house was being processed, investigators examined the grounds. But there was some heather and bushes and things there, and Bob Knudsen pushed, as I recall, pushed the heather aside, he and Terry White, and there were scrapes, fresh scrapes, on the rock under the heather which subsequently matched the scrapes in the gas tank in the bottom of the car. Yep, yep, it's a good match. Now all we gotta do now is finish photoing the rock, get it ready for court. Inside the house, 
investigators found hair from three persons. Two matched the victims. The third matched the unknown hair also found in the automobile. The car, the two women, and a third person had been at the house. And the only people who had access to the house while the owners were away were the employees of the security company. Once again, police turned to Kenneth Bianchi. Authorities obtained a warrant to search Bianchi's house for clues to the murder. What they found instead was a basement full of stolen goods. The stolen property was enough grounds to arrest Bianchi and hold him until police could gather evidence to link him to the murders. <coughs> Investigators later learned that he never showed up at his law enforcement class on the night Wilder and Mandic disappeared. Police had no trouble finding him on patrol at his security job. Right Forensic specialists matched the foreign hairs found in the car and the house in Washington to Bianchi. Undoubtedly, he had been at these locations. Though confident that Bianchi would prove to be their man, investigators had no idea who they actually had on their hands. Frank. A California driver's license found in his possession prompted a call to the Los Angeles authorities to check on prior offenses. The detective that took the call was part of the Hillside Strangler Task Force and recognized the similarities. Yeah, I'm sitting down. It was the call Detective Frank Salerno had been waiting two long years to receive. You're kidding me. Not only did he live next door and across street from two of our victims, but he had lived on Tamarind, which was the Kimberly Martin case. So right away, we've got a guy that's connected by location to three of the victims, and we never had that before. Hair found in his car in Washington State matched two of the hillside victims in Los Angeles. Uh, yes. Uh, Frank, Bianchi's fingerprints also linked him to the murder of the prostitute. Faced with undeniable evidence, Bianchi confessed to the hillside stranglings and named his cousin, Angelo Bono, as his accomplice. Well, we took all the evidence, which amounted to uh, one tuft of fiber and one clump of fiber, uh, and we served a search warrant on Angelo Bono's house and his trim shop. A search of Bono's car upholstery shop brought an exact match of the white fibers found on two of the hillside victims. The cousins explained how they found their targets, cruising the streets of Hollywood posing as undercover cops. Some of the victims were prostitutes who were easy to lure into the car. Others were simply stopped and arrested on bogus charges. Once a woman was in the car, she was handcuffed and taken to Bono's shop, where she'd be tied up, raped, and strangled to death. Then, it was just a matter of disposing of the body under cover of darkness. Just stand here. In the corner by yourself, just the corner like by that. Yeah. In the state of Washington, giving up the death penalty. Uh, how does a defense a defendant plead to count one of the information? <coughs> Guilty. How does the defendant plead to count two of the information? Guilty. Bianchi pled guilty to two first-degree murders in Washington and confessed to ten murders in California. He and Angelo Bono are currently serving multiple life terms without parole. Many consider big cities to be havens for violence and murder. But the truth is, there's no law that keeps serial killers within city limits. In October 1980, some hikers were enjoying the serene beauty of Mount Tamalpais State Park in Northern California when they made a gruesome discovery. The body of a young woman lay flat on the ground. She had been shot in the head and raped. Police arrived to process the scene. 
The victim was 26-year-old Ann Alderson. She'd gone to the park to meditate the day before and had not returned. Detective Rich Keaton of the Marin County Sheriff's Department led the investigation. The park has almost like a sanctuary and it has kind of a reverence in it and overlooking San Francisco Bay. And to have such a violent crime occur in a pristine area was just out of the ordinary. There was not much evidence at the scene. Traces of biological material found around the body and the bullets removed from the victim were sent to the crime lab in Santa Rosa with the hopes that they might point to a suspect. Forensic specialist Mike Waller set out to determine what type of weapon was used in the murder. By evaluating the bullet under a stereo microscope such as what I have here, and by looking at the class characteristics and measuring them, we can get an idea of a potential model or make in some cases. And one weapon that uh, was a, po a possibility in this case turned out to be what is known as a Rossi 38 Special Revolver. Done the aerial photos. We put up Without a suspect or weapon, the identification provided no help. Investigators had no choice but to shelve the case until more information turned up. They didn't have long to wait. A month after the murder, detectives were searching for two missing women on the trails at Point Reyes National Seashore in Marin County. But they didn't find what they were looking for. Two bodies, a man and a woman, lay face down in the woods. They had been shot to death. Police surveyed the scene but were disappointed with their findings. They uncovered no footprints. There were no hairs or fibers, only the bullets. While officers finished processing the scene, police found the women they had been looking for. They, too, were dead. Both women were naked. They had been shot and raped. No fingerprints or other telltale clues were found. My first impressions were that this was almost a shock, that this wasn't really happening. We couldn't have four more bodies found in a park of young women and one young man who were simply executed for what appeared to be no other reason than sexual violation. Investigators now had five murders and still only a handful of bullets as clues. By examining the barrel marks left on the bullets, Mike Waller confirmed authorities' worst fears. All the bullets recovered from the various scenes had been fired from the same gun. Now there was no question about it a serial killer was stalking victims in the state parks. But detectives were no closer to finding who he was. Papers called the murderer the Trailside Killer. Detectives knew that a true serial killer wouldn't stop until he was caught, and catching him wouldn't be easy. The killer was cunning the murders well planned. Police hoped that someone may have spied the killer before he made his kills. A task force collected accounts from people who had seen a strange man on the hiking trails earlier in the day. They put together a composite sketch from their descriptions. Investigators also assembled a profile of their suspect based on case histories of similar murderers. He would be a white male, 20 to 25, who was tall and thin, with black hair. He would be good looking and charming, an outgoing guy with a winning personality. Once the sketch was approved by the task force, flyers were distributed throughout the county to alert the public. Warnings were posted at the state parks 
and agents hiked the trails undercover. The FBI was brought in to assist with the investigation. Police were busy hatching an elaborate plan to stop the killer. They called it Code 555. The idea was to immediately shut down all roads leading out of the county the second the next attack was reported. It wouldn't prevent another murder, but it was the only way authorities could see to apprehend a suspect. And something had to be done. The community was frightened to death. The hiking trails became vacant. People quit coming to the parks. The suspect's face was posted everywhere in an effort to warn the people of Marin County. But police were ready. Code 555 could be deployed in a moment's notice. Next time the trailside killer struck, there would be no escape. Bodies were found on the left-hand side of the mountain. Always like in some fairy tale, in the beautiful mountains of Northern California, there dwelled a monster. Though four months had passed without incident, investigators knew the trailside killer wasn't finished. In March of 1981, visitors to Henry Cowell State Park were taking a break at the observation deck when they heard screams. A terrified young man was limping up the trail toward them, yelling hysterically. He had been hiking with his girlfriend when a stranger approached and shot them both. His girlfriend was dead, and the killer was still loose in the park. The police arrived in minutes, but the murderer had slipped away undetected. Stephen Hartle was rushed to the hospital. Marin County Police had been ready for the trailside killer, prepared to shut down all exits from the county. It would have worked, except that this latest attack occurred outside their jurisdiction in Santa Cruz County. The trailside killer was on the move. He took great delight in watching what the police agencies were trying to do and that he was staying always one step ahead of us, one step ahead of apprehension, and was probably taking great glee into the fact that uh, he was not being identified, not being discovered. And uh, I'm sure that he was reading every news article that came out. Santa Cruz police found some footprints at the scene and took plaster casts for future comparison. Those and the bullets were almost all the evidence authorities had. But there was one thing the killer didn't count on. Stephen Hartle had survived the shooting. He was an eyewitness. But when police showed him the sketch of the trailside killer, something was horribly wrong. Hartle didn't recognize him. In fact, he was certain his shooter was another man. Authorities now faced the shocking possibility that Hartle and his girlfriend were victims of a copycat. The man Hartle described looked nothing like the killer in Marin County. He was large with broad shoulders. He wore glasses, a mustache, and had thinning hair. And most unlike the trailside killer, this man was 20 or 25 years older. Detectives swiftly distributed the second sketch around the area and redoubled their efforts to catch not one, but two killers. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Then a call came in to Detective Keaton that set the record straight. The lab had compared the bullets from the Santa Cruz attack to the ones in Marin County. They were a perfect match. The bullets had been fired from the same gun. There was no younger man. The first suspect composite had been a terrible, time-consuming mistake. Authorities had been looking for the wrong man. Made they quickly dispensed with the first sketch and concentrated on the eyewitness account. So instead of it being a young white male in his early to mid-twenties, we were looking at a male who was actually about 50 years of age. Hey, hon. 
While the hunt continued, people went about their daily lives. Heather Skaggs needed a car. She'd shopped around for a few months with her boyfriend, but had no luck. It's on David Carpenter. She decided to check yeah, out a car that one of her co-workers had found for sale. Yeah, I've got a number in my purse, because I do need to get going now. Before she went off, she jotted her co-worker's phone number. His name was David Carpenter. Heather was running a little late and had to rush if she was going to meet Carpenter on time. They said their goodbyes and then Heather left for the last time. In the morning, when she hadn't come home, her boyfriend turned to David Carpenter for answers. Okay. Carpenter hadn't seen Heather or heard from her at all that day. Concerned, her boyfriend went to the police. When police questioned Carpenter, he told them the same story. But his resemblance to the sketch of the trailside killer was difficult to overlook. For two weeks, they kept him under surveillance. When a background check revealed that he'd previously been convicted for rape and assault, investigators brought him in. Although the murder weapon was nowhere to be found, investigators retrieved a single 38 caliber bullet from his car. It was rushed to the lab for analysis. Heather Skaggs' body was found a few days later. It came through pretty glass. Okay. Stephen Hartle had recovered fully from the attack and was brought in to look at a lineup. He had no trouble picking out the man who had shot him and killed his girlfriend. There was no doubt in his mind that David Carpenter was that man. At long last, authorities believed they had captured the trailside killer. Finally, the parks were safe. The senseless murders would stop. But to make the case, officers still needed to find the murder weapon. Then, police received word from a man in prison who had known Carpenter. He had information to share in exchange for a lighter sentence. He told police that if they searched a certain vacant lot in San Francisco, they'd find Carpenter's gun buried under some rubble. The weapon was sent back to Mike Waller at the lab for final testing and identification. By test firing the gun himself, Waller had bullets to compare with those collected from the murder sites. When the two were put together, they matched perfectly. Without question, both bullets were fired from the same gun. Police had in their possession the weapon that had killed seven people. In addition to the ballistics evidence, blood and saliva samples taken from Carpenter matched the biological evidence taken at the first crime scene. And Carpenter had recently purchased a pair of shoes with treads that were consistent with the casts taken from the trails. David Carpenter had little trouble finding and capturing his victims. From a mountain vantage point, he could oversee the trails and make out lone hikers. Knowing exactly where they were headed, he could easily ambush his prey. In execution style, Carpenter shot his victims in the back of the head. David Carpenter was convicted of a total of seven counts of first-degree murder and three counts of rape. He was given two death sentences. Carpenter specifically targeted women for his sexual gratification. Male victims were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Though most serial killers are men, they don't always prey on the opposite sex. In the spring of 1983, 
A young man was discovered dead in a field off Interstate 294 in Lake County, Illinois, just outside Chicago. He had been bound, tortured, undressed, and stabbed multiple times. It appeared to be an isolated incident. But within a few weeks, another body turned up just off the interstate, less than a mile from the first, and in eerily similar condition. In both cases, detectives could find little at the crime scenes to lead them to the killer. Four months later, a third victim, Ralph Calise, was found murdered in the same manner along the same stretch of highway where the first two victims were found. The press gave the murderer a name, the Interstate Killer. It was at the Calise site that authorities gathered what they hoped would be their first fruitful clues. Most important were footprints and tire tracks. Although not necessarily connected to the murder, it was the first time any type of prints had been recovered. Investigators made plaster casts in case a suspect emerged. Detective Dan Collin knew it would only be a matter of time before he killed again. When we had the third victim in August, which was uh, Ralph Calise, uh, then we knew we had, a, obviously, a, 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 an individual working the, the north side of Chicago. If you're still alive over there. Aware that serial killers often move around to avoid capture, Collin notified neighboring jurisdictions. When Lake County police described their victims, authorities in Indiana recognized the pattern all too well. They had been investigating nine of their own unsolved murders that fit the killer's profile. All the victims had been stabbed in similar fashion and abandoned near highways. The manhunt took on new urgency now that police knew the killer had crisscrossed state lines to murder 12 men. In their pursuit of the interstate killer, Indiana and Illinois law enforcement pooled their resources. Acting on a tip, Indianapolis police had singled out one suspect, a man named Larry Eiler, who had been arrested for a similar crime and acquitted. Even as Indiana's number one suspect, there was no hard evidence against him. Authorities couldn't make a move until he moved first. But when and if he did, they were ready for him. Illinois police had the plaster casts of the footprints and tires taken from their last crime scene. If Indiana authorities could find a way to compare the prints with Eilers, they were welcome to them. In less than a month, they'd have their chance. On September 30th, 1983, an Indiana state trooper stopped and questioned two men in a truck parked on the side of a road near Interstate 65. The driver explained that they had just stopped for a bathroom break but the patrolman ran a routine check anyway. He called in the driver's name. It was Larry Eiler. So what happened was when the, when the state trooper ran his name, one of the dispatchers recognized the name and from there um, contacted a detective sergeant with the Indiana State Police who then said arrest Larry and bring him into custody and bring him to a little station for questioning. Among the things found in Eiler's truck were a pair of boots, a knife, and a bag of rope. It looked like police had found the interstate killer just in time. Can you open the door, please? Eiler was hauled into custody and subjected to a day of intense interrogation. He remained calm and denied having any knowledge of the murders. But while he was being questioned, Investigators were busy gathering evidence from the items seized during the arrest. At the crime lab, examiners processed the evidence that had been confiscated. The tires had been taken off of Larry Eiler's pickup truck 
and were rolled and printed with the hopes of matching the tread to the plaster casts made at one of the interstate killer's crime scenes. Within days, investigators were confident of their findings. It was the news police had expected. The tire tracks matched perfectly, as did the boot prints. Larry Eiler had been at the scene, and now they had the evidence to prove it in court. But the prints only linked Eiler to the area where the body was found. It didn't prove he had killed Ralph Calise. That information was hidden within other items seized from Larry Eiler at his arrest. The soles of Eiler's boots were caked with dried blood. It matched the blood of Ralph Calise. A knife found in the truck also showed minuscule traces of his blood. With such conclusive evidence, investigators were sure they had their man. They charged Larry Eiler with the murder of Ralph Calise and set about preparing for the trial. It looked like the end of the interstate killer. It wasn't. All the evidence amounted to nothing. The evidence was thrown out because of what's known as the exclusionary rule, the fruit of the poisonous tree. You can't illegally seize evidence and then use it against somebody. Apparently, the sergeant answering the officer's call mistook the routine surveillance alert out on Eiler for a detention order. He had been arrested unjustly. Even in the face of indisputable forensic evidence, nothing could stick unless the proper procedures had been followed. The bloody knife, the boots, and the tire track were ruled inadmissible. Eiler was released. Police would have to start over. Eiler was guilty and he was free. All that authorities could do right, was helplessly watch and wait until he tried to kill again. The Illinois police attempted to maintain surveillance on Larry Eiler, not only to prevent another murder, but also hoping that he would slip up and leave behind some evidence they could use. But constant surveillance was impossible. People can say that, well, why didn't the police watch them? There's no way that we can put, you know, men around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, watching somebody. It's almost impossible to do. Uh, why people are going around their normal, everyday life. We couldn't do it. So it was a matter of when was Larry going to kill again? And Danny Bridges was our answer. In August of 1984, a janitor at a Chicago apartment building watched a man from a neighboring building dump some garbage bags into the wrong dumpster. This had happened too many times before, and the janitor took it upon himself to remove the bags from his building's trash receptacle. But as he lifted the bag, it tore, exposing the horror within. A human leg protruded through the plastic. When police responded, they recognized the address of Eiler's apartment building right next door. The trash bags contained the dismembered body of a young man identified as Danny Bridges. Even though this was not the interstate killer's style, authorities were certain the bags would eventually lead back to Eiler. The trash bags were sent to the forensics lab at the Chicago Police Department. Forensic investigator James Doran was in charge of the examination. We paid particular attention to the plastic bags in which the dismembered body parts were in. And if the reason for that is we felt if we could develop any type of impression or a latent fingerprint on here, we could tie this up to a suspect. The bags were fumed to bring out any prints. Doran discovered several perfect sets. To no one's surprise, they belonged to Larry Eiler. Investigators had him once again, right where they wanted him. This time, they were meticulous. 
the evidence was unquestionable. All procedures had been followed. Yeah, well, I think the one that Tyler's found interstate in reign of terror was over. Or so he thought. All right. Bye. When Eiler was questioned, he explained that he'd thrown some things in the dumpster and had to move a few bags to make room. Apparently, he said, he must have moved the body bags. Authorities knew he was lying, but the truth was, anyone could have touched those bags once they were in the dumpster. His simple alibi was airtight. Once again, it looked like the interstate killer was going to walk away scot free. Hoping to bag a killer, the trash bags that contained the body parts were fumed for fingerprints again, this time on the inside. There, in one of the bags, forensic expert James Doran found a single print left by Larry Eiler. I mean, there are no two people in this world with the same fingerprints to date. And unless Larry Eiler could explain away why he had his thumbprint, or fingerprint, on the inside of that bag, containing a part of Danny Bridges. We had the person who killed Danny Bridges. Armed with a single fingerprint, police arrested Eiler at his apartment and charged him with the murder of Danny here. Bridges. Once more, authorities had Eiler in custody, but this time they were going to make sure that he wasn't released. Every inch of the apartment would need to be examined in order to build a foolproof case to take to court. Initially, investigators found the apartment virtually spotless. But as they began to probe, they uncovered pieces of a puzzle that told of a grisly murder. The story of Danny Bridges' death was found in bits of evidence collected throughout the apartment. And all discovered in the bedroom was found to have small traces of human blood on it. Although the samples were too minute to match to the victim, investigators felt it was probably the weapon that caused the punctures found in his body. The frame of a hacksaw that detectives believed was used to cut up the body was also found to contain traces of human blood. But again, it wasn't enough blood to link to Danny Bridges. For such a violent crime to have occurred in such a confined space, authorities were surprised to find the apartment so clean. Detectives supposed that if the body was dismembered in the apartment, the killer would have done it in the bathroom. They took up the threshold, hoping to find some blood that Eiler wouldn't have thought to clean up. Their hunch was right. Underneath the bathroom threshold, was enough dried blood to be tested. It was sent to the lab. To get a clearer picture of how the murder transpired, investigators switched off the lights. Luminol is a chemical that glows on contact with even the faintest traces of blood. When detectives sprayed the mixture, the truth shone through. The brutality of the crime left its stains throughout the apartment. Microanalyst Marion Caparuso was responsible for extracting trace evidence at the scene. When we were doing the, the luminol processing, although we knew that there was blood uh, at the area, there were none of us that were really prepared for the scope of uh, the amount of blood that was present, the pattern of the wipes. Uh, I think there was uh, an audible uh, sigh as we realized that the, uh, the luminol processing gave us such insight into how the crime scene was actually cleaned up. The blood samples were analyzed to determine if they matched Danny Bridges or if they were from some other unfortunate victim. At the time, DNA testing was not available. 
The uh, type of testing that could be done in the mid-1980s was genetic marker testing. I did an analysis in six genetic marker systems and determined that, in fact, the blood under the threshold did match the type of Danny Bridges. That particular combination of types occurred in 3% of the Caucasian population. That level of precision coupled with the other evidence, was enough to convict Larry Eiler of murdering Danny Bridges. He was sentenced to death. Eventually, he confessed to killing 22 others over four years. On August 21st, 1994, he picked up Danny Bridges outside a bar. But instead of driving to a remote outdoor area, this time, Eiler took the young man home. After tying him up, Eiler stabbed and tortured his victim. He had to drag the body to the tub in order to cut it into pieces small enough to dispose of. Blood covered the apartment. And though he'd taken careful measures to clean up, the stains of his guilt were indelible. Even after a serial killer is caught, his motives remain elusive. Experts know only that these murderers are relentless in their drive to kill. Investigators are equally relentless in their mission to stop serial killers. Though the crimes are enormous, success often hinges on a series of tiny clues the killer leaves in his wake.